Today is Wednesday, May 24th, 2023. We're glad to have you with us at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin tonight. We are back together to study the book of Genesis one more time. We are in Genesis chapter 50 tonight, which is the very last chapter in the book of Genesis. So I want you to invite you to be finding a Bible and turning with me to Genesis chapter 50. We'll be back there in just a few moments, but we're very glad that you've joined us. And we also want to invite you to be with us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 a.m. for about 45 minutes of a Bible study. And then we'll get together at 10.30 a.m. for a time of worship, singing, and the Lord's Supper, and prayer, a study of God's Word, and so on. And as always, if you have any questions or concerns about what you see or hear in class tonight, uh, we want to hear from you. So send an email to... Uh, info at fourlakeschurch.org or send a text or make a phone call to 608-224-0274. We would love to hear from you in that way. And as always, if you haven't yet subscribed to the YouTube channel, we want to invite you to do that as well. In terms of our calendar, please remember that we plan on grilling out together as a congregation this coming Lord's Day right after worship. So I want to invite you to be there for that. I believe grill meat is being provided along with water, and you're invited to bring sides and desserts and any other drinks. There is a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board at church, uh, but I do realize it may be officially too late to look at that list at this point. I may be stopping by the building on Friday or Saturday, and so if you're wondering, I'd be glad to take a picture of the sign-up sheet and email it to you, let you know what's on there. But just bring something to share and plan on sticking around after worship to uh, participate in some bonus fellowship this coming Lord's Day morning. Uh, four days out, the weather looks really good. Looks to be about perfect this coming Sunday, so we'll see whether that holds true, uh, but I am looking forward to seeing all of you on Sunday. But again, tonight we wrap up our study of the book of Genesis, which is the first book in the Bible. It is a book of beginnings written by the prophet Moses. And we started this study back on April 20th, 2022. And yesterday, I looked back at my notes for that very first class. And apparently, I was recovering from COVID at that point. And I know exactly where I got it. I caught it on Friday morning, April 8th at 8.30 a.m., <laughs> uh, sitting at Firefly Coffee House down in Oregon. That, that was the only contact I had with other human beings during that time. And Firefly shut down on Saturday. They put it on their uh, social media saying, hey, we're all sick here. and <laughs> We're not going to be opening uh, due to an outbreak among their staff. And I was feeling fine, but Sunday night a year or so ago, uh, I felt a little bit off, kind of clearing my throat a few times. And by Monday, I had this crushing headache and a temperature of 103 and uh, tested positive the next day. And I spent the next five days watching, I don't know, five or six seasons of This Old House on Roku all in a row. Uh, but anyway, right after that, I think about a week later, we started our study of Genesis. And so it's been just over a year, and I know it's been a long study, but I think we've made very good progress. We have not been lazy in this. I don't think we're moving too quickly either. I think we've been moving at a pretty good pace. Genesis has 50 chapters, and we've pretty much covered one chapter a week with a few guest teachers as I've been out of town a few times. And so tonight we wrap it up. Our goal in our Wednesday class is to study a book of the Bible straight through, one chapter at a time, pretty much. So uh, here we are at the end of the book of Genesis. So to bring us up to speed, uh, maybe I could summarize the whole book of Genesis in about a minute. Uh, but we've had the creation, we've had the flood, we've had the Tower of Babel and the confusion of the languages. And then we were pretty much uh, very closely uh, after that introduced to Abraham. Then we had Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then the last third of the book is focused on Joseph, uh, one of the sons of Jacob. So a number of years have passed now after the famine has been survived. And Jacob, or Israel, the patriarch of the family, has given a series of blessings to his children. That's what we looked at last week. And he's now died in the last few verses of chapter 49. So we're now ready for the last chapter. So tonight we come to Genesis chapter 50. And let's look at verses 1, 2, and 3 to begin. Genesis chapter 50, verses 1 through 3. Then Joseph fell on his father's face and wept over him and kissed him. Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. So the physicians embalmed Israel. Now forty days were required for it, for such is the period required for embalming. And the Egyptians wept for him seventy days. Well, as soon as Jacob dies, Joseph seems to be the one who makes the first move. He's really one of the youngest children. 
Uh, but he's the one in charge. He's got the power now. He's the man. And so he falls on his father's face. He weeps. He kisses him. As second in command in Egypt, notice Joseph orders the physicians to embalm his father. So the physicians are his servants. It must be kind of nice, right? And most of us, I think, have probably studied this at least a little bit. Uh, I remember a trip to the Field Museum in Chicago back when I was a kid, and I remember being just fascinated by the embalming process. Do you remember that from when you were a child and learning about, they did what? Kind of a strange thing, but uh, the giant hook that they would use to uh, pull the brain out through the nose, that has an impact on a, a fifth grader. And uh, all of that, as I remember it, they would separate a lot of the organs from the body during the burial process. So it was long, it was complex, a lot of steps to it. And that's what we find here. So it takes 40 days to get through this. Of course, in our culture today, a burial or a cremation can be done in a day or two. But they had some very long and complex traditions down there in Egypt. And although uh, Jacob was not an Egyptian, his son was an Egyptian ruler. And they follow the local customs for the embalming process. And then notice at the end of verse 3, we find that the mourning continued for 70 days. So they are mourning the father of the man who helped save them from the famine. So this is very public, a very public mourning process. So let's continue then with Genesis 50, verses 4, 5, and 6. Genesis chapter 50, verses 4 through 6. When the days of mourning for him were past, Joseph spoke to the household of Pharaoh, saying, if now I have found favor in your sight, please speak to Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Behold, I am about to die. In my grave, which I dug for myself in the land of Canaan, there you shall bury me. Now, therefore, please let me go up and bury my father, that I will return. Pharaoh said, Go up and bury your father, as he made you swear. Basically, Joseph asks Pharaoh's permission to go bury his father. And I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm wondering whether we might be seeing just a, a slight shift in attitude between Joseph and Pharaoh. Maybe, maybe not. Uh, but it's interesting to me at least how Joseph asks for permission. Remember previously, nobody could do anything. They couldn't even lift a finger without asking for Joseph's permission. But now though, Joseph is the one asking for permission. Maybe this is significant, maybe not. Maybe he's just being respectful. After all, this will involve Joseph leaving the nation with a rather large caravan for a few weeks. But then again, maybe the relationship has changed somewhat. When we talked about this a few weeks ago, remember we noted that this particular pharaoh seemed to be somewhat young and that he was perhaps mentored by Joseph, who was older. Well, now though, maybe pharaoh has grown up a little bit. Maybe pharaoh is gaining his independence, and maybe that relationship is shifting a little bit. And so, for whatever reason, Joseph asked permission to go bury his father up in the land of Canaan. And in the process of asking, I also want to point out that he promises to return. And that right there is a little bit interesting as well, isn't it? I mean, why promise to return if not returning was even an option? So maybe Joseph could sense that Pharaoh was worried that there was a risk of Joseph leaving for Canaan and never coming back again. He didn't want to lose him, and so he goes through this formal process of making the request, and in the process of making that request, he promises that he'll come back after it. But ultimately, though, Pharaoh allows this. Let's continue with Genesis 50 and continue on with verses 7 through 11. Genesis 50, verses 7 through 11. So Joseph went up to bury his father, and with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his household, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the household of Joseph, and his brothers, and his father's household. They left only their little ones, and their flocks, and their herds in the land of Goshen. There also went up with him both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. When they came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond the Jordan, they lamented there with a very great and sorrowful lamentation. And he observed seven days mourning for his father. Now when the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning at the threshing floor of Atad, they said, This is a grievous mourning for the Egyptians. Therefore it was named Abel Mizraim, which is beyond the Jordan. Once again, I don't know about you, but I'm getting a, a similar vibe, we might say, up in verse 7, just as we did in that last paragraph, that 
Pharaoh might have been just a little uneasy with some of this because not only does Joseph go up to Canaan with his family, but notice all the servants of Pharaoh go up as well. So maybe they're there just to carry the coffin. Maybe this is just a sign of respect. Maybe this is just to offer their support. Maybe this is just a special official delegation to honor Jacob and his son Joseph. But then again, maybe it's because Pharaoh was somewhat concerned that Joseph and his people may not come back. They do, though, leave their children. They leave their flocks and their herds back in Egypt, back in the land of Goshen. So maybe they don't have to make the trip. Maybe that's the point of this. Don't want to put them through that. But maybe also to kind of calm Pharaoh's fears that they may not come back. So if they leave the kids behind, if they leave all their stuff behind, uh, maybe there's a better chance that they'll, that they'll return for that reason. So they get to the land of Canaan. They mourn. And I want us to notice this is huge. They mourn for seven days. And in fact, it's such an impressive display of mourning that even the locals are impressed by it to the point where they rename the place in honor of what happened there. All right, let's continue then with Genesis chapter 50, verses 12 through 14. Genesis 50, verses 12 through 14. Thus his sons did for him as he had charged them. For his sons carried him to the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah before Mamre, which Abraham had bought along with a field for a burial site from Ephron the Hittite. After he had buried his father, Joseph returned to Egypt, he and his brothers, and all who had gone up with him to bury his father. Well, this just gives us a summary of what they did. And uh, they did what Jacob had asked them to do. They buried him in the cave in the field of Machpelah, the family burial site. And they do this, they then return to Egypt. Not just Joseph, but uh, everybody comes back together in one big group. All right, let's continue then with Genesis 50, verses 15 through 20. Genesis chapter 50, verses 15 through 20. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, What if Joseph bears a grudge against us and pays us back in full for all the wrong which we did to him? So they sent a message to Joseph, saying, Your father charged before he died, saying, Thus you shall say to Joseph, Please forgive, I beg you, the transgression of your brothers and their sin, for they did you wrong. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants of the God of your father. And Joseph wept when he spoke to them. Then his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not be afraid, for am I in God's place? As for you, you meant evil against me. But God meant it for good, in order to bring about this present result, to preserve many people alive. So therefore, do not be afraid. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Once dad is gone, the other brothers get a little bit nervous, don't they? Dad's gone, so now they're worried Joseph might finally take vengeance. Maybe this is what he's been waiting for, and now the time has come. So... You know, they thought maybe Joseph was being nice only to keep dad happy. Well, let's note that they definitely know that what they did was wrong, don't we? I think that it's very clear here that that's the case. They understand this according to the end of verse 15. This is years later, and yet these men are still concerned about it. They know they did wrong. They know that Joseph knows they did wrong, and they're worried about retaliation. And I think rightly so. Uh, Joseph is certainly in a position to retaliate. And so the brothers approach Joseph and they explain that dad told us to tell you to forgive us. Just a little bit of a thought question here. I kind of really wish we could discuss this one. Did Jacob really say that to his sons? You know, personally, I don't think so. Maybe, maybe he did say this. Uh, but I think there's a better chance that these men are just making this up, that they're covering themselves here. <laughs> Dad told us to tell you to forgive us. I mean, if he really wanted Joseph to forgive them, I think he would have said that in the previous two chapters as he was coming near the end of his life. And as he was giving all of these instructions and uh, bury me here and take me there, and that would have been the perfect chance for this, but he doesn't do it. But whatever the case, when they communicate this to Joseph, he weeps. I'm just trying to put myself in Joseph's position here. I'd be torn up, wouldn't you, that your brother still think of me in that way? Really? You think 
You think I'm like that? You think I would kill you? You think I would retaliate so many years later? I mean, it's been years, but these guys think that I'm about to go on some murderous rampage. Who do you think I am? Um, you know, the only thing holding me back is being scared of my dad, and now that dad is dead, I can, I can do whatever I want? I mean, that's an awful thing to assume about somebody if we try to put ourselves in his place. And I wonder if they're thinking this way because that's what um, they would have done. <laughs> You know, a lot of times we project on people what we're feeling. So maybe if I was him, I would take vengeance after dad was gone. And, and this is what I would do in that situation. I don't know. Uh, but we know that they throw themselves on their brother's mercy. They uh, pledge to be his servants. Notice in verse 18, they actually bow down before him once again. And I missed that the first time I read through that earlier today. Uh, but yet again, they bow down before their brother. And if you remember, that was Joseph's dream from the time he was very young, that his brothers would someday bow down before him. And we've seen this uh, fulfilled a number of times now. I don't know where we are the fourth or the fifth time that these men have bowed down to their younger brother. Well, in response, Joseph tells them not to be afraid. And then we have one of my favorite statements anywhere in Genesis. I, I think this makes the top five of my favorite statements, my favorite verses in this whole book. Uh, notice verse 20 where Joseph says, As for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about this present result to preserve many people alive. And I believe that right there summarizes the last one-third of the entire book of Genesis. Joseph's brothers set out to hurt their younger brother. Uh, that right there was evil. To beat up your brother, throw him in a pit, and sell him to a caravan heading for a foreign nation. That's evil. God didn't do that. They did that. However, God took that evil that they did, and God used it for good, saving the nation of Egypt as well as, a, as, well as his own people, so preserving them through this famine by using that evil behavior, using it for good. So I think what we have here is an after-the-fact statement concerning God's providence, Providence is a word that we use sometimes. It's found in Scripture a number of times, but it's basically God's provision for his people, God's way of taking care of us. Often, when we're in the middle of some terrible situation, it's impossible for us to understand what could possibly good could come from this. Because we're drowning in it. We're, we're over our heads. These terrible things are happening. Maybe we get disillusioned because of it. Some people will turn away from God when terrible things happen to them. However, sometimes many years later, if we hang on through it, a lot of times we can look back and we're finally able to understand that God was with us through that situation and that he cared for us and that he provided for us through it. Again, not that God caused the terrible situation, but God is often able to redeem us and use that situation for our own good so he can see us through it and do some good as a result of it. You might think about Paul and the book of Philemon. Philemon was a Christian slave owner whose slave Onesimus ran away and seems to have gone looking for Paul in Rome. And I kind of why, wonder why. How did this guy who knows Philemon, Philemon's slave, how did he find Paul? And I'm thinking he probably overheard his master talking about Paul in a good way. And so I'm thinking in my mind as this slave runs away, i got to find Paul. i got to find this guy that my master is speaking so highly of. And of course, as we progress through that book, we find um, that this slave runs to Paul in Rome, where he's eventually converted. And then Paul sends Onesimus, the slave, back to his master, along with a letter, book of the Bible now, a very short book, a short letter we hope to study in our Sunday morning adult Bible class this summer. But in that one chapter book of Philemon, Paul very diplomatically encourages Philemon to welcome Onesimus back willingly. And then notice this is what Paul says in making this argument. For perhaps he, that is Onesimus, the runaway slave, for perhaps he was for this reason separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother especially to me, but now much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. And I absolutely love how Paul describes Onesimus, not as a runaway slave, but as someone who has been separated from Philemon for a while. Is that not the most diplomatic thing you've ever heard? 
It doesn't say your slave ran away, that you were separated from this young man for a while. And then he says, perhaps, perhaps God played a role in this, the providential perhaps. And I always find it interesting that even as an inspired apostle, Paul didn't look back on that and say, God did this. And I want to use that to caution us to be very careful about saying the same thing. Even when we look back on something, let's be very careful about saying God did this to me or God did this for me. Because I'm just saying, even as an inspired apostle, Paul said, perhaps, maybe, maybe not. But looking back on it, it sure seems that that is the case. So maybe also in a similar way, Joseph shifts the emphasis away from being beaten by his brothers and sold into slavery. And he shifts that toward God saving everybody through that process. I think there's a lesson there we can learn. Um, we might also think about what Paul wrote over in Romans 8.28. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God and to those who are called according to his purpose. So again, it's not that God causes all things, but God has a way of taking things that happen and working them together for our good, for those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. That is, those who are willing to submit to his plan, which Joseph absolutely did submit to his plan. Uh, without getting beat up by his brothers, Joseph never would have made it to Egypt. Without getting falsely accused by Potiphar's wife, Joseph would have never landed in prison. Without being forgotten by the cupbearer, Joseph would have never come before Pharaoh. So those are three very bad things that happened to that young man, but all of those bad things led to something very, very good, and God was able to orchestrate that through his providential care. And what an amazing lesson for us. When terrible things happen to us, we may have the power to take revenge, but we don't have to take revenge. I think that's something else we learned from Joseph here. If we can be gracious and forgiving, if there's any way for us to be gracious and forgiving, let's be gracious and forgiving. That doesn't mean we can't protect ourselves and our families. Uh, this doesn't mean that we can uh, necessarily have to let somebody avoid the bad consequences of their behavior. Uh, sometimes bad things have to happen to people to teach them a lesson. Uh, but it means that we're willing to forgive when somebody demonstrates repentance as the brothers are doing here. They definitely had some regrets, and Joseph certainly does not hold this over their heads. And Notice here, not only does he not hold it over their heads, but Joseph even goes above and beyond, doesn't he? He promises to provide for them and for their families. He speaks kindly to them, and he comforts them. Well, let's conclude tonight with the last paragraph. This is Genesis chapter 50, verses 22 through 26, the very end, the last paragraph in Genesis, Genesis 50, 22 through 26. Now Joseph stayed in Egypt, he and his father's household, and Joseph lived 110 years. Joseph saw the third generation of Ephraim's sons, also the sons of Machir, the son of Manasseh, were born on Joseph's knees. Joseph said to his brothers, I'm about to die, but God will surely take care of you and bring you up from this land to the land which he promised an oath to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Then Joseph made the sons of Israel swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones up from here. So Joseph died at the age of 110 years, and he was embalmed and placed in a coffin in Egypt. In the last paragraph, life in Egypt continues, doesn't it? And Joseph sees his grandchildren being born, perhaps his great-grandchildren, depending on how you read this verse. But what a blessing that is. So he's had a, a long and a fruitful life, and he sees... The end of his life approaching, he brings his brothers in. And remember, they're older than he is, so he's dying a little bit before some of them age-wise, but he reminds them that God will be with them, that God would bring them back to the promised land. And at the very end, Joseph makes them promise that they will take his bones with them when they leave Egypt to go back to the land of Canaan. So when you leave this place, take me with you. Joseph then dies, his body is embalmed, his body is then placed in a coffin in Egypt. So note here, Joseph is portable, isn't he? Um, he is not sealed in a pyramid, even though he saved the nation as an honored ruler, but Joseph is portable. Joseph is placed in a to-go container, is the way I would look at this. And what an amazing statement of faith, isn't it? Joseph believes with all his heart. 
that his family will not be in Egypt forever, but that God will bring them out of Egypt and back to the promised land someday. I hate to spoil this for us, but if we flip over to Exodus 13, verse 19, we actually have a record of the last thing they do right after the 10th plague on their way out the door as they leave Egypt a few hundred years down the line here. This is Exodus 13, verse 19. On their way out, Moses took the bones of Joseph with him, for he had made the sons of Israel solemnly swear, saying, God will surely take care of you, and you shall carry my bones from here with you. I love that. I think that has to be maybe in the top five or top ten list of favorite passages. Uh, what a statement of faith coming from Joseph. You will leave, and when you do, take me with you. And then you have uh, Moses after the ten plagues, and it's time to go. We are booking it out of here. They had the Passover meal. It was quick, unleavened bread. We're, we're on our way and as he looks around, right on the way as they leave, grab the coffin. Somebody grab the coffin. Grab the bones of Joseph. He made us promise. And uh, that promise is now being fulfilled. We are taking him along. I still have a tradition. Whenever we go out to eat anywhere in the Madison area, I always look under the table for sippy cups. And when our kids were little, we left those sippy cups all over the place around Madison. <laughs> we'd always get home. We'd be missing one or two. And so I joke today as we leave a restaurant, even now, I'll kind of bend down, look under the table, make sure we got all the sippy cups. And I kind of see that's the way Moses was leading this entire nation. Two to three million people were on our way out the door. Got everything we need. Wait, somebody grab the coffin. And we're taking the bones of, uh, of Joseph with us. And we have another interesting reference over in Joshua chapter 24 concerning what happens once they finally settle in the promised land. Joshua 24, now they buried the bones of Joseph, which the sons of Israel brought up from Egypt at Shechem, in the piece of ground which Jacob had bought from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for 100 pieces of money, and they became the inheritance of Joseph's sons. I almost think of those survivors of the attack on Pearl Harbor who are eventually buried on the Arizona, along with their shipmates. I don't know if you've seen pictures of that. It'll hit the news every few years. I don't know. How many survivors are left right now, if any? But there are some of those men, when they die, they want their remains buried on the Arizona. And it's kind of a similar thing here. But what a statement of faith on his part. And then also what a reminder. As these guys are, are living in Egypt, as things turn sour, as they get basically turned into slaves over the next several hundred years, there's this coffin over here. And somebody's remembering the promise. We are not here forever, as bad as it might be. And then even as they travel through the promise, or through the uh, wilderness for 40 years, they've got the Ark of the Covenant, they've got their stuff, but they've also got a few people carrying a coffin. And there is a reason for that. One quick note on Joseph's age. He dies at the age of 110. And what do we notice about that? The lifespans in Genesis have continued to very steadily decrease ever since the flood. So people are no longer living more than 900 years as they did before the flood. But they're now living only into their early 100s and pretty close to the upper limit of how long people live even today. Abraham lived to be 175. Isaac lived to be 180. Jacob lived to be 147. Joseph lived to 110. So if we could put all those on a graph, we would see 900, 800, 900 right there before the flood. And then after the flood, uh, they just take a kind of a nosedive and keep on going down uh, until they kind of level out around the age of 100. So just making a note here of Joseph's age when he dies. So this brings us to the end of Genesis, the first book. And this book has truly been a book of beginnings. So we've got the beginning of the universe and of the world itself, the beginning of life on earth with the creation of Adam and Eve, the beginning of the human race, the beginning of sin with the eating of the fruit of the tree that was under the band, the beginning of uh, God's plan of salvation. There was that prophecy there back in chapter 3. We had the first death with Cain killing his brother Abel. We had the beginning of various languages with the uh, Tower of Babel. We had the beginning of God's special relationship with Abraham and his descendants. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And really that's uh, the bulk of the book and uh, kind of explaining how all that started. In terms of an encouraging lesson, I'm thinking we have the reminder in Genesis that God keeps his promises. He will save us. 
uh, he will never flood the earth again, and so on. So I think we have some promises given and made, and then some promises kept. So that's, I think, a very practical, encouraging lesson. In terms of another practical lesson, I think we've seen from Genesis that it's always better to do what's right rather than what's wrong or more convenient. You know, Joseph was strong. He stuck by his convictions. While his brothers did wrong and suffered the consequences, he um, ultimately came out on top. And I think we see both sides of this, not only with Joseph, but in uh, a character like Abraham. Whenever Abraham took a shortcut, things went south. Uh, but when Abraham obeyed God, things went well. So God will always be with his faithful children. That seems to be a good lesson from this book. Um, and let me know if you know of more good, practical, solid lessons kind of looking at Genesis overall. But I think those are some of the highlights, at least for me. Uh, Lord willing, I'm hoping we can continue on into the book of Exodus. I think that'll save us some time studying the background material. So let's just keep rolling. Um, Exodus is simply the continuation of Genesis. So a few hundred years will go by, we'll pick up with uh, Exodus. And you may want to come prepared next week by just reading the entire book of Exodus all at once. That'd be a great start. I'm, I'm guessing it would take 45 minutes or so. So not a, not a terrible thing to do. I think it'd be very helpful. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. I hope to see most of you in class this coming Lord's Day at 930. And then we plan on coming together for worship at 1030. And don't forget... Uh, plan on sticking around after the worship assembly. We'll head out to the backyard, do some grilling, and uh, get to know each other in a little bit of a different way than we normally would by uh, sitting together and singing together. So there's a benefit to coming together. I'm really looking forward to it. Uh, let's close this, uh, this evening by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we praise you tonight as being the God of creation, the God of beginnings, the God of everything that we see around us. Thank you, Father, for communicating with us through your book. And tonight we're especially thankful for your servant Moses and for his skill and for his willingness ultimately to serve in the way that he did. We're thankful for your providential care for your people in times like we've studied in class tonight, but also today we're thankful for your care over us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for watching over us. And, and more than anything, we're thankful that you've made a way for us to be saved. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.